We hadn't lived in the house but a month. <laughs> Such a strange house. Octagon shaped. You could almost get lost if you explored too much. As such, I spent many a day on the front porch here in the garden. Oh, I loved the smell of lavender. And that's when I saw him first. My love. He was standing right there in the center of a path. He had made up some excuse about lending something or other. It was, it was pretty silly. My mother had gone into town for some essentials, and if she knew that I were alone with a grown man, well, grown is a bit of an exaggeration. He was all but 18. But I would have been slapped across the cheek. Or worse. <laughs> it was his eyes that drew me in. They're so different from my own. They're as blue as the ocean. <laughs> I should know, my mother and I were very well acquainted with the sea. We traveled from France when my father died, and for days I would just watch the endless blue of the sky and the horizon. His eyes were bluer than any day on that ship. He timidly asked to be shown around, and I obliged. And at first I kept my distance from him. He was talking about some neighbors and Washington Irving. <laughs> I never really cared for his silly stories. We got to the front porch and I stood perfectly still. He kept talking about spooky stories and some wild turkeys he had recently hunted. Oh gosh, it was just one of those moments. Do you know the kind? When you almost realize the importance of it as it's happening? Maybe it's God. Maybe it's electricity. <laughs> All I know is that I would remember that moment forever. He got even closer to me and, and I could smell his breath. It smelled sweet, like something foreign to my senses. Then our lips touched and our fate was sealed. <laughs> After that, I'd find him wandering around the garden, <laughs> a stolen kiss under the Kentucky coffee tree. Notes dropped on the back door with a sprig of lavender. Our encounters were, were brief, but intense. And the blue of his eyes are all I could think of in the space in between. One night in late summer, I told him to meet me promptly at midnight on the banks of the Hudson. We both showed up early. <laughs> oh, we laid in the grass for God knows how long. And now I know that you are all God-fearing people, so please try not to judge me. We, we spoke into the wee hours of the morning, and we made wild, passionate uh, proclamations, and <laughs> we spoke of building a home, a life, a family, an eternity. It was a night of utter enchantment. And then the next day, the shift, the day his parents discovered our love affair. How could our pure-blooded American boy get tangled up with immigrant trash like her, they said. These immigrants, they're invading our country. It's funny, I, I never really have thought of it as invading, more like improving. But my own mother disagrees. She tells me our blood does not mix. Besides, apparently he's betrothed to a Yankee girl down the river. His parents lock him in a room for close to three days, and he's not offered any food or water as punishment until he agrees to end our relationship. Except not really. This is where the steamboat comes in. Do you have many steamboats on the Hudson these days? The next morning, I receive a note on my windowsill. Meet me at the Terrytown dock, 3 p.m. sharp. Do not be late. We wed in New York City upon arrival. Freedom awaits. <laughs> I had already picked out my wedding garb. Do you like it? <laughs> I, I know that it's simple, but simple love requires so little in terms of extravagance. So there we were at 3 p.m. at the Terrytown dock, hand in hand at the bow, soon to be husband and wife. We're not really doing much talking. The crowd is loud and boisterous and it's, it's hard to hear. I feel my, my palms getting sweaty. Our fingers are tightly intertwined. Our boat prepares to depart and starts to race. 
Our boat, along with the one on the rival dock, rev up their engines. It's common practice to race and a great way to drum up business, especially for the winning boat. As they rev up their engines, the sounds of the, the crowd begin to soar. What a send off to new life. I see him, he's smiling at me. Our fingers are still tightly intertwined. And then we feel the boat lurch forward onto the delicate waves of the Hudson. This is freedom. This is freedom. And then boom, silence, but not the silent kind, the nauseating, pulsating kind of silence that rushes over you when something's knocked you across the back of the head. I, I open my eyes and I try to distinguish up from down and right from left. I see the faces of my fellow passengers screaming, but I cannot hear any sound. Their faces are wrangled as if in shock. And, and then I, I notice my hands, I'm, I'm no longer holding his. And that's when I see him. When I see him, I, I see his face first. His eyes are blue and icy. There's blood coming down on either side of his face. He's lying in a blanket of dark blood. A boiler had burst. There had been an explosion and our boat is engulfed in flames and sinking quickly. I threw myself on top of him and there are men trying to pry me away and I just kept holding on tighter. Then before we knew it, I, I started making a, a very quiet descent into the Hudson. Then surrounded by billowing lace and, and, and clouds of smoke, I pressed my lips firmly against his and I drown. Two days later, they discover my body on the banks of the Hudson. Bloated and blue, I am presented to my mother in a wooden box. They lie me by the ginkgos and the lavender. But my mother never comes out of her octagon house. She says that no daughter of hers would ever run off with a man like that. So rejected, I am buried in a potter's field. My love by and by is not found. Maybe eaten by fish or creatures from down below, maybe swept off to sea. Do you see what hate can do? We could have had so much more, so much more. And instead I wander here lost without my love. If you're ever in the garden, you might spot me keeping a lookout on the cupola. Next time you're here, do say hello.